Thank you very much. Lovely to see you all. Um, over, the last, um, over the last few weeks, we've been uh, looking at a series in a book in the Bible called the Book of Acts. And I'm going to be reading from Acts chapter 9 in a moment if you want to follow it on your device or if you have one of these old school kind of paper copies, you, you can do that. If you're newer to church, what we do week by week is we have some time where we sing amazing songs, sometimes like this morning. Weren't those... I, I've seen that video a few times now. It's just amazing, isn't it, to see and hear the stories of those that have been baptised today. Um, but one of the things that we do week by week is we read from the Bible and somebody speaks about the Bible. Why do we do that? Well, I know as part of my journey and my story that when, as somebody that was not yet a believer in, Christ in Christianity and in Jesus, when I started reading the words of Jesus in this book, it was like the words were coming alive to me. It's like they were speaking to me. And we've been singing about how Jesus is risen, how he's alive. And actually, as we read this in a moment, you know, he, he can speak to you. He can speak to us through these words. So why don't we read uh, from Acts chapter 9. I'm just going to read a few verses. In the context of this, last week Tim spoke about a guy called uh, Saul, Saul of Tarsus, who's also sometimes in the Bible referred to as Paul, depending on which part of the ancient world you were from. He used those two different names, Saul or Paul. And Saul was definitely not a Jesus follower. In fact, we heard last week how he was a killer. He was hunting down people that were following Jesus, approving of their death, dragging them off into prison. And where we've got to in the story is, he was on his way to Damascus, so he was from uh, a part of the world from the, the nation of Israel, he was going to another country to track down Jesus followers and have them extradited back so they could be put on trial and punished. And we heard last week how on one of these journeys to Damascus, he encountered this amazing bright light. He was dazzled by it. His companions saw it, but he heard the voice of Jesus saying, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And his response, it says he fell to the ground. He's going, Lord, who, who are you? And Jesus said, I am Jesus, whom you're persecuting. When he got up from the ground, he was blinded. And Jesus said to him, now go into the city, and there you'll be told what to do to wait. So by the hand he was led as a blind man into the city, actually to a house on Straight Street, belonging to a guy called Judas. So we're going to read the passage now from Acts chapter 9, verse 10 onwards. In Damascus there was a disciple named Ananias. The Lord called to him in a vision, Ananias. Yes, Lord, he answered. The Lord told him, go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. In a vision, he's seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. Verse 13, Lord, Ananias answered, I've heard many reports about this man and all the harm he's done to your saints in Jerusalem, and how he's come here with authority from the chief priests to arrest all who call on your name. But the Lord said to Ananias, Go, this man is my chosen instrument to carry my name before the non-Jews and their kings and also before the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Then Ananias went to the house and entered it. Placing his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord, Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, 
the Lord has sent me, so you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes, and he could see again. In Acts 22, as Paul as was then was telling his story, he says this, he adds when he tells his story, that Ananias then said, what are you waiting for? Get up and be baptized. But here in this Acts chapter 9, it says he got up and was baptized, and after taking some food, he regained his strength. This morning I've entitled my talk this, and it's taken from Acts chapter 9, verse 13. You cannot be serious. In the message version of the Bible, it's on the screen, it says that when he was confronted by God to go and share the good news with this killer called Saul, he's like, you can't be serious. Jesus, you can't be serious. I, I don't know in your own experience where you, I don't know if somebody's maybe said to you or asked you to do something and either verbally or internally you thought, you've got to be joking. You cannot be serious if you're expecting me to do that. And sometimes, actually, we can be nudged by God and we can have that reaction. I don't think so somehow. You know, a number of years ago, I was, uh, I was, what I try to do each day is I try and take my Bible and read some verses and say, God, what, what do you want to speak to me today through this? Because in a crazy, busy, difficult world, to get some truth and some goodness and to hear what God actually thinks about me and the promises he's made is, is a great thing to do. So I try and do that every day. I remember one day I thought rather than sit in the house, I'd go down to my local park. Went down to the park, sitting on the bench. It's a summer's day. I'm just enjoying the sunshine. I'm reading some of this. And I glance up and sitting, uh, walking about maybe 200 meters away is a lady with her dog just walking. And I, as I look, it's like... I felt one of those nudges. I don't know if, you, if you're a Jesus follower here today, I don't know if you felt one of those nudges to do something. Maybe an act of kindness towards somebody. Maybe to say something which would help somebody. Well, I'm sitting there reading my Bible. I look up, I see this lady with her dog, and I feel this little nudge from God. And it was like, into my mind came this thought, you need to go and say to that lady, tell her how much God loves her and cares about her. So I'm reading my Bible, I'm praying, and I, this thought comes into my head really strongly, and I'm like, nah, you can't be serious. I'm trying to pray. I'm reading my Bible, I haven't got time for that. I don't, I don't want to do that. I don't want to respond to that. So I try and keep praying and try and read... And it's just like, it just won't go away. I think I've got to do this. But inside I'm saying, you can't be serious, God. I'm thinking of all the reasons why, how weird is that going to be? It's no good. Oh, I can't sit here any longer. So I start walking across the field. And as I'm walking, I'm thinking, oh, what on earth am I going to say? This is going to be so weird. You know, I'm going through this internal dialogue about what I'm going to say, what words are going to come out. I'm getting closer. This lady with a dog is like, notice this man's walking towards her. It's all a bit strange. So I walk up to her and say, hi, I know this is really weird. I'm a Christian and I was praying. And, and I, I told her, I said, look, as I was praying, I wasn't thinking about anything. I just felt that God wanted me to say to you that he knows about your situation and he loves you and cares about you so much. And as I said that, she just burst into floods of tears. I think, all right, what do I do now? So there's this moment where she's weeping, the dog's there and I'm there, the dog, which is an Alsatian, German Shepherd, fierce thing, looks at her, thinks, this stranger 
has made my owner cry. He is a threat. So she's crying, the dog's there, and then the dog decides to latch onto my backside with its teeth. <laughs> so there's this quite awkward moment where she's crying, I'm crying, <laughs> the dog's there, I'm trying to... You know, I don't know if you're a dog lover here. Yeah, I'm trying to be sensitive to those people that love dogs and animals, but really, you know, I don't want that. I don't, I don't want that dog biting me. And at one moment, she's like drying her eyes and sort of like saying, oh, oh, you know, don't worry, he's only playing, you know. <laughs> it was actually quite painful. And anyway, the conversation sort of was quite short, and I just, I had a, a small card and some information about the Alpha course, and I just said, look, you know, if, if you want to sort of, know some more, you can look, look at this, and, you know, I'm just trying to sort of, like, keep it brief. I remember walking away. I was so painful. I got home, and Sarah, my wife's a nurse, I said, oh, can you have a look at this? You know, and she said, I think you need to go down to casualty. So it's a bit awkward, isn't it? It's all healed now. You'll be glad to know. Have you ever had that moment, ever felt a prompt to do something that you just think, no way, you can't be serious. It's in Acts chapter 9, verse 10. It says, in Damascus, there was a disciple named Ananias. And really this morning, I think what, some of what maybe God wants to say to us is that you know, he's really happy to spend time with ordinary people. You know, our media will say that it's the celebrities that are important, it's the, it's the people with influence and power and money. They're, they're the important people. You know, the, maybe the marginalized, the outcast, the, the unknown, the forgotten, the hurting, the broken those just with mundane lives, mundane jobs. They're, they're, you know, they're not important. But God has got a different view. It says in that verse in, chapter ten, um, in verse 10, it says, in Damascus there was a disciple named Ananias. And we don't really know very much about him. Just to be clear, there's another Ananias earlier in the book of Acts. It's not that one, it's a different person. But we don't know much about them. What we do know is because of this guy Saul, there was a, a massive persecution against the church. And the church was scattered. They fled. They, they were fleeing the persecution. Well, Ananias wasn't one of those. Because it says, actually, he was known in Damascus as being somebody that was God-fearing, that had a good reputation in the neighborhood, had a good reputation as being somebody that lived a, a, a right life. And he was a believer in Jesus somehow, but not somebody that had fled. But pretty much that's all we know about him. Somebody just very ordinary. And what about maybe for you and me here today? You know, are you just an ordinary person? Do you feel like you've got, in many ways, an ordinary life? An ordinary time at school studying, an ordinary time looking after children, an ordinary time maybe signing on at, at the job centre, or an ordinary time, an ordinary life. I wonder if you could put this picture up, Mark. This is a, a man called Alf Cooper. I would say Alf Cooper is just an, an ordinary man, postman from a part of Cornwall, if you know where the Eden Project is. He was a postman in the villages around there, a place called St. Blasey and Parr. Just an ordinary guy. Window cleaner as well. But in many ways, there are no ordinary people with God. Every single person in this room today, because God loves you, you are extraordinary to him. And this would include this, this guy, 
Alf Cooper. See, he wasn't, he wasn't a believer. He was just going about his daily life, doing his thing, and eventually ended up studying in Bristol. He, was, he would say he was like a, a passionate atheist, but went on a journey. Actually, with some friends, they started looking into all sorts of different spirituality. And on that journey, he had an encounter with Jesus. And when you encounter Jesus, he takes what can seem ordinary in our lives and do extraordinary things with them. Ordinary person. Some of you may remember, I think probably all of us may remember in 2010, the amazing and moving scenes in Chile that we saw on our television screens as those miners were trapped underground, the Chilean miners, 33 of them, and the amazing rescue attempt. I was looking at some statistics. I think they were trapped 2,260 feet underground. A three-mile journey underground is where they were. It's a, it's a phenomenal story. And as they were trapped there, one of them uh, was a, a Christian, and they asked him to pray. And out of those 33 miners that were down there, actually 22 of them became Jesus followers as a result of being in that situation. In fact, they came out saying there weren't 33 miners down there, there were 34 because Jesus was with us all the way through. Well, this guy, Alf Cooper, not only did he go from having a relatively ordinary life, what actually happened to him? He became a Christian, and he became the chaplain to the president of Chile. From postman to chaplain. He became chaplain just before the Chilean miners thing happened. And live on television, the Chilean president asked him to lead the nation in prayer. An ordinary disciple. So you can see the president's the guy with the blue tie and Alpha's the guy in the middle. One billion people watched that whole kind of thing unfold around the world. It's incredible, isn't it? And what about you here today? We heard last week how God calls Saul. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And in this story, in, in verse 10, we see that the Lord called to him, to Ananias, the Lord called to him, do you today hear his voice calling you? In our crazy, busy world, do we just take a moment now and tune our ear in to hear the Lord calling you? It could be like Saul. You know there's something going on. You sense something. But in some ways, there's a blindness. You're not sure about this whole thing about God and Jesus. Or maybe like Ananias, maybe you've been a believer in Jesus for a while and you're sensing him calling you to take some adventures and steps with him. But it takes courage to respond to Jesus. Initially, when, when God speaks to Ananias, he's going, you can't be serious. You want me to go and do that? You can't be serious, Jesus. You can't be serious. He's saying, go to the house of Judas on Straight Street. And then in verse 15, when Ananias was protesting, Jesus says, go, exclamation mark in my Bible, this man, Saul, is my chosen instrument to make me known in the known world. See, I love the story of ordinary lives. That's why I love the video. Just you've got... You know, you've got a golf caddy coming to Jesus. You've got Rachel's amazing cakes, which looked fantastic, didn't they? And her, 
just so articulate at such a young age about her simple faith in Jesus. And Nicole, who is a guest on our current Alpha course, who the week before last came up and said to me, I'd like to get baptised. So I'm like, really? What, you mean you've become a Jesus follower? Yeah. I don't know if you know this, but she has been to church, I think. I think this might be her fourth Sunday in church when she got baptised this morning. I love the stories of ordinary people. One of, one of the people I've got to know is, uh, I was really prompted to, I asked him if I could share his story. And it's a friend of ours in church called Dan Pullen. Some of you know Dan. I wonder if you could put this, the picture up of, of him. So Dan is the guy with the yellow helmet. Then Austin is another friend there. But Dan is the guy with the yellow helmet there. Now, the reason I wanted to tell you Dan's story is this. His story is he was not a Jesus follower. Dan has a, a, a history of extreme sports. So he lived in the Alps for a number of years and was an extreme snowboarder. You know on the, like, um, those, you see those, uh, like, GoPro videos and stuff like that. He was into all that kind of thing. And his story is this. He said he was totally lost, totally broken, nearly died three times and realized that God saved his life each time and coincidentally met some Christians when he was out in the Alps and then one of them became his wife, Jen. And that's, that's his story. And in an email to me, he said, because I said, look, can I, can I tell a bit of your story? He just said, God has taken somebody that's broken and fixed, put him back together and given him so much. Well, now, Dan doesn't do the skiing stuff so much, but he's probably, I said he was in the meeting earlier, I didn't want to embarrass him, but he's probably the nearest that I know out of the people in the circle that I know who are into sport, who's probably the nearest to a professional cyclist that I know. He runs his own bike repair business in Brighton called M Plus One, there's a coffee shop there. And he is now uh, going to manage a, a race team, a cycle race team. And you can see the jersey there. Now, the reason I wanted to tell Dan's story was this. He is an ordinary person that has met an extraordinary God and had his life turned upside down. Thousands of people know Dan through his business and through his cycle racing. He came and met me for a coffee and said this. He said, we're starting this race team. We have some commercial sponsors who are backing the team. But he said this, he said, one of the things I would wonder, would King's Church consider partnering with our race team? We're not expecting any money for that. Sponsors normally put money. He said, we're not looking for anything like that. But would King's Church partner with my race team? And he said, the reason is I can put your logo, the King's Church logo, on every bit of publicity that goes out, on all the race kits, on the team cars and everything. You might just be able to see it. It's one of the smaller logos right at the back there in the middle. So that means that every cyclist in a race, when they're following, because obviously his team are going to win, when they're following, <laughs> they're going to see the King's Church logo. He said, the reason I'm doing this is people know me, but I want them to know that I know Jesus. That's courageous, isn't it? He's putting his head above the parapet. A friend of mine, Ram Babu, Indian evangelist, I remember him saying this. He said, courage is not the absence of fear. Courage is the conquering of fear with the help of God. So who, who do you identify with today? Because you'll identify with one of the two people in that story. Maybe for you today, do you identify with Saul? Are you, I'm not saying you're a breathing murderous threats against the church, but what I mean is this. You sense there's something about God. You've had some sort of inkling that Jesus is trying to call you and get your attention. But it's not clear. And in some ways, maybe I'm like an Ananias to you now, and I'm saying, 
brother Saul, or whatever your name is, the Lord has sent me so that you may see clearly who this Jesus is. So maybe you're in that category. Or maybe you're in the category of Ananias. What what is it that God might be prompting you to do today or this week that you just think, no way? Acts chapter 9 verse 13 says this, Ananias protested, Master, you can't be serious. So, so which, which one are you? If, if you're a, a Jesus follower today, what is it that he is trying to encourage you? What's he been prompting you about? Is it that maybe for the very first time you're going to fess up to your friends that you're a Jesus follower? Maybe you're prompted that you've seen somebody that's moved in across the street and they seem to be living on their own. Maybe it's you're going to take a cake round there and just greet them and welcome them to the neighbourhood. I'm not preaching Jesus at them, but maybe showing an act of love and kindness. Maybe it's in your class at school. Maybe you're going to spend time with the kid that everybody else shuns and you're going to make an effort to include them in your friendship group. What is God asking you to do today that maybe you think, really? Do I have to do that, God? I wonder if the band may just come up, please.